So we'll run through this. And then following this talk, I think we have about a 15 minute break. We need people to have a chance to uh, get a drink or go to the restroom if they have to. Okay. <clears throat> so the next uh, talk is thoracic trauma. And again, uh, if you look at the percentages on the surgical critical care exam, there is a good number of uh, trauma. And actually, is a, when I took it for the first time as a fellow, I actually was very happy to see trauma questions on there because <clears throat> Uh, by the time I was uh, done with the fellowship and the residency, I'd had a fairly large exposure to trauma. It was very pleasing to see, you know, uh, a trauma question every now and then instead of having to worry about a critical care question. So, all right. So chest trauma, uh, about 25% of all traumatic deaths can be attributed to chest trauma in general. Uh, this is the third most common cause of traumatic death. Remember, TBI is the first and chest is third, belly is the uh, second. Um, <clears throat> there's uh, mortality wise, we can talk about uh, what kills you from that standpoint. Early death, meaning pretty much at the scene uh, of injury within, you know, literature tells us 30 minutes to three hours. So either at the scene or maybe during transport <clears throat> or early transport, it's basically one of two things. It's either an airway issue due to obstruction or aspiration or something like that, or tamponade. And that could be up to a third of the patients that you're taking care of. Uh, beyond that, uh, uh, you know, death is due to a number of uh, various things, whether it's in hospital mortality uh, due to the pure chest injury or multiple traumatic injuries. Um, <clears throat> the causes... Uh, civilian trauma in the civilian world, uh, blunt is more common, about 70% of these, much more common in the military world, which is about 15% of uh, injuries uh, seen in the military environment, uh, a little bit lower because of body armor. And uh, we tend to see penetrating uh, injuries, uh, the common uh, killer, uh, primarily because the uh, patient gets struck because they don't have their body armor on or uh, the uh, projectile slips through uh, an area where the body armor is not covered, unfortunately. All right. <clears throat> the other thing, surgical intervention, you've probably seen this stat uh, before. It's not, it's, it's a common stat that questions are asked about. In blood trauma, it, 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 there's a very low incidence of surgical intervention, a little bit higher than penetrating trauma, but still uh, one of the favorite uh, statistics that uh, questions uh, the, they like to ask on a test is this one right here, uh, that basically in the setting of chest trauma, chest trauma can be managed 85% of the time with a chest tube or less intervention, chest tube or less intervention. Early survival depends on initial resuscitation and the correct, uh, the correction of uh, any diagnostic investigations, basically uh, life-threatening injuries, which we're going to talk about in a minute. <clears throat> late survival depends on the same thing that most uh, late survival in any trauma patients uh, depend on, which is post-traumatic complications. You know, does the patient have a, a PE? Do they develop sepsis or something like that? So in the setting of chest trauma, uh, the ABCs are no different, except in the primary survey, this is the one setting in trauma where we may have to do something in the primary survey. As we're doing the ABCs, we may have to stop at A or B or C to get control of an airway or to accomplish a FAST exam, a pericardial FAST exam, and provide an emergency procedure, whether it is a, uh, a rush off to the OR because of tamponade or provide a chest tube to prevent or treat a tension pneumothorax. <clears throat> and it's not until those things are done do we typically make it to the secondary survey. Secondary survey is a complete physical exam with chest x-ray, et cetera, labs uh, as necessary. Um, this is just a slide just uh, for statistics, sentinel injuries. We talk about, you know, if you have a, a first rib fracture, which we know takes a significant impact, uh, we can potentially expect injuries to the head or the neck 50% of the time. Same thing for scapular, lower rib fractures. Uh, a great question that uh, lawyers like to associate with splenic bleeds uh, with lower rib fractures. So it's not uncommon to see that. <clears throat> All right. So let's say we have a 33-year-old female in the ED. Uh, she's got an isolated stab wound to the right chest. 
She's stable and her fast exam is negative. The vast majority of penetrating injuries to the chest are treated by what? Something we've kind of already talked about. Remember the statistics, the, fast, the vast majority, greater than 85% of penetrating injuries to the chest are actually treated by uh, chest tube or less. I know that C is less, but uh, uh, chest tube is the correct answer from the literature. All right, we're talking about the five life-threatening injuries to start with. Um, <clears throat> And these are injuries that you may actually have to take care of uh, in the primary survey, not all of them necessarily. So the first one is a tension pneumothorax. Now, the bottom line in any patient is you should really never ever see this chest x-ray. Uh, a tension pneumothorax is truly a, a clinical diagnosis. Um, the pathophysiology is that air enters the chest, uh, typically through uh, a, uh, the trachea, and it can't get out. <clears throat> so there's initial injury to the chest that causes a, uh, a separation of the parietal and visceral pleural with a little air layer. And then if there is uh, uh, obviously air coming in through the trachea that escapes the lung through a puncture in the lung, it can start building up in the layer between the parietal and visceral pleura. And then as that air continues to build up, it really does not have a way to get out of that space. It's not going to leak out of the, the, the stab wound, and it's not going to go back into the lung and, and come out of the trachea. And so it just continues to build up. Uh, in the setting of attention pneumothorax, we see a mediastinal shift to the contralateral side. Obviously, we know this can cause a cardiovascular collapse, uh, beginning with a decreased venous return because of the pressure on the, the soft veins in the chest. This causes the the uh, category uh, we call this obstructive shock. There may be little to no symptoms. You really only need two symptoms. And if one of the questions I ask usually is what two symptoms does anyone really think that uh, you need to diagnose a, uh, a tension pneumothorax? So if I would to give you two symptoms uh, to diagnose a tension pneumothorax, what would those uh, minimum two symptoms be that would push you to decompress the chest without a chest x-ray on it from a clinical standpoint. Anybody got any guesses out there? What minimum two symptoms would you want to decompress the chest? There's a lot of various symptoms associated with tension pneumothorax. Uh, there's really only two that you need. Good, good, I agree. Uh, hypotension in decreased or unilateral breath sounds. Perfect answer. Uh, if you have those two, then that is a tension pneumothorax uh, by definition and decompress that chest. All right, uh, the treatment obviously is, uh, or actually uh, the treatment obviously is chest decompression. One of the most common causes though of tension pneumothorax is mechanical ventilation with PEEP. Uh, and so something to think about along the line, you know, uh, some people uh, use this as an argument to place prophylactic chest tubes in patient, and it's not, uh, not an uncommon or not a bad argument, especially if you're gonna send a patient off to the OR for a number of uh, uh, hours and say they have a sliver of a small pneumothorax that doesn't need a chest tube traditionally on their CAT scan, <clears throat> but then you're gonna send them off for two or three or four hours to have a femur fix with ortho. And, uh, and you want to waylay that concern uh, because it's, uh, you know, in the middle of an ortho case with the patient fully draped, uh, attention pneumothorax is not a fun entity for those guys to have to deal with. Uh, it's a clinical diagnosis. Treatment can be eating, eating decompression. The uh, classic location for immediate decompression is the uh, second intercostal space in the mid line. Now, we also see a lot of patients coming into the uh, trauma bay with uh, with needle decompression from the field, here's some interesting stats from literature that was done a number of years ago. 
basically, if you take a look at these numbers, it takes an eight centimeter long uh, angiocatheter or needle to reach the pleural space greater than 90% of the time. So that's why I think we find that many of our decompressions from the field are not in the pleural space or, or not effective uh, because of this statistic right here. You can just obviously decompress these. You know, as trauma surgeons, we can do that just by placing a chest tube in the fifth intercostal space, anterior to mid axillary line uh, from, for standard therapy. All right, massive hemothorax is by definition, you can't really define this until actually after you place the chest tube, but essentially if you feel like there's uh, greater than a liter and a half of blood in the chest, then this patient needs uh, some therapy because excuse me, in kids, it's gonna be a third of the blood volume uh, in, their, in their chest cavity. Uh, you typically will, with a massive, a true massive hemothorax, experience or begin to experience some sort of hypotension and not just unilateral breast sounds, have some significantly decreased breast sounds on the affected side, uh, if it's a true mass of hemothorax. <clears throat> Diagnosis can be made with a chest X-ray, but it's not truly made until you place a chest tube and start draining blood. If it's truly a mass of hemothorax, by definition greater than a liter and a half, then the treatment not only is a chest tube, but uh, literature tells us that patient should go to the OR for a thoracotomy and have the uh, source of bleeding uh, uh, arrested. Um, other defining reasons to take a patient to the OR for a thoracotomy are listed here. It's not just greater than one and a half liters of, uh, and this is on the, the, the one and a half liters on the initial placement of the chest tube. If the patient continues to have, and there's a number here greater than 200 cc's hour for the next two or four hours, that's nice if you want to track that. But the bottom line is that the third indicator